I'm still wearing the glasses. Been getting needle shots in my eye uh, to reduce swelling. It's all a good thing. Diabetes has been doing great, and uh, but there's some swelling from not taking care of my diabetes a few years ago. And uh, so they're re reducing that. And uh, I can't wear contacts for a couple days. It used to be five days. They've limited it down, down to two. So tomorrow I can wear them. But anyways, that's what's up with the four eyes. I don't care if you call me four eyes down in the comments. That's fine. It's no big deal. I've, started, I've been wearing glasses since I was in first grade. Think about that. Contacts since I was 12. I'm 52. Soon to be 53. So been going a long time. So I've, I've heard four eyes before. You can't hurt me. <laughs> that's the way it goes. But... Um, I really wanted to talk about some of the weird stuff that Dylan and I and the guys see each year when we're designing properties. And, you know, people say, you know, I bet you've never seen this, and we have. And these are some of the more common weird things, so maybe they're just unique. Uh, but I see down in the comments, we get a lot of comments. Um, what would you do if? And there's always this long paragraph. And unfortunately, when I'm going through comments, if it's more than a sentence, two sentences, I really can't take the time to read it because there's so many. I really want to answer as many as possible. So when there's really long uh, questions, I can't get to them. And unfortunately, we get dozens a week of people that want us to help with them with their property online and through email. And when we visit 100 people a year, around the road 100 times a year, we're shooting videos 50 times a year, putting out 208 videos a year, and working with sponsors, partners, and doing our own thing with family, friends, and hunting, then it's really difficult to answer those so we can't, uh, bottom line is. So try to answer as many comments for you on this channel, on Instagram too. Make sure you follow me on Instagram. That's something uh, I really spend a lot of time on Instagram too. Most time here, but, uh, but bottom line is that's an area I try to put some time into. Um, but we get these unique, um, you know, parcel designs and parcels. And again, you know, you might say, what What do I do if this? Down down in the comments below. And I try to help out as many people as possible. So that's why I'm picking some of the crazy, real weird stuff. Because I'm hoping that some of you can relate to some of these right here. And I think some of you will, especially with small parcels. Um, when you have big parcels, they, they tend to encompass so much ground. Let's say 500 acres plus, 400 acres, 300 acres that um, you can be a little bit uh, more resilient to things that are going on around you that might negatively affect you to a greater degree on a parcel that is much smaller. So in these right here, a cabin and a house, and this is what I see a lot where um, we'll have a, let's just use a 40 acres for example in a lot of these, be a 40 acre parcel and be a road coming in and then here's the cabin or house right in the middle of the property. To say, what can I do? You know, and a lot of times they're looking at it like, we want to have as many acres dedicated to white tills and wildlife and sanctuary area as possible. We have this road and we have this house right in the middle of the property. What do we do? And we see this a lot and it's not necessarily a negative. And what I mean by that is you start to look at your property more in a linear fashion than a big block of cover. Linear meaning you can work on this area right here all the way around the parcel. So look at a linear fashion. You're trying to get deer to move parallel to your borders still and in a linear fashion around the property. What I like about this is let's say you have a food source down here in the corner then you can try to create movement with thick cover travel corridor leading up to bedding areas in the corner maybe another food source down here. The bottom line is you're trying to link these together so that deer can move in a linear fashion giving them plenty of cover in between. I wouldn't put food plot, food plot, food plot, food plot, food plot all the way around. If in a case like that, it might be that you have a couple acres of food plot, you might have an acre here and an acre here. One might be in one corner, the southeast corner. One might be in the northwest corner, and then you have all bedding and cover in between. So deer have plenty of room in a linear fashion to bed away from that food and away from your house. I tend to find in areas like this that they're not remote. Typically, not all always, but they're more of a, quote, rural suburban area where the more rural estates where they're mixed in where you have 10 acre parcels 20s 40s five acres and houses and so you tend to see more like that and i'm not saying that's again the case in everywhere but if it's in big woods area then you're attracting deer from the neighborhood into a food source hopefully you're adjacent to public land so that i see a lot of these up north where the people can come right out here go sit on public land right up here as deer are leaving their land and going back to bed in the morning 300 yards off their property border 
So now it gives you an assemblage of morning stands back on the public land or maybe on the neighbors that you lease. And then it gives you those evening food source stands that you can, and this is the beauty of this, where no matter what the wind, you can just go right out from your cabin, 100 yards, 75 yards, sit in the stand and blow your scent back to the cabin. So you're blowing, you're using that cabin as a dead zone for deer, because it is, and then you're blowing your scent back from every angle. So this can work out really well, and it might be that you sneak down the driveway, someone's leaving from work in the morning, they just drop you off at the road. I've had clients do that where their spouse would be going to work, they drop them off on the road down here, they walk down this field edge, get in, wait for the deer to come back, they're on a food plot down here in the southwest corner. So there's things that you can do like that to be a little bit more mindful of while you're just leaving from the cabin and always driving out to this corner stand right here. Make sure you have an exterior access trail and then make sure you have multiple stands within 75 yards of the house because the deer are used to that and blow your scent back from the house. There's lots of different ways you can look at this, but your really bottom line is you're looking at this as your sanctuary. All the way around that sanctuary includes your food, your cover, your travel corridors, and then you either have stands that are on the edge here where you can blow your scent back at the house, or they're back here where you're wrapping around maybe the non-food source corner. Let's say there's no food in the southeast corner, it's all over here and you're coming over back here to a stand and getting around that waiting for the deer to come back to you. And then if it's public land, it's even better because you can go swing way out. I used to do this on, we had acreage up in the UP of Michigan and we lived there, but I would go down the road. The road actually bisected both property parcels, but I'd go way down the road, go back to the National Forest and get into a stand that was a couple hundred yards off the border, wait for deer to come back to me or go onto the property from the forest, or I'd literally drive seven miles, walk in for 40 minutes, and get about a mile north of the property and hunt mature bucks that were moving around that swamp out there with unpressured federal land acres and wait for the deer, wait for that buck to come around to me during the daylight. And uh, it was a great bedding area approach for morning stands. So then I'd swing back all the way around and hunt more of the property by the food source in the evening. So. I hope that makes sense, but that's one way, a unique way that you can look at this. And before I, before I forget here, we want to mention, um, you know, certainly we have our new web class, Hunting Hills and Thermals. It's very detailed. Dylan did a great job on the graphics. Um, and, uh, and we talk about that, but it's over 50% of you hunt within hills enough that you have to really worry about thermals. I saw a comment the other day on a, on a post we had or on a um, YouTube video they put out about hunting hills and thermals that it makes it very difficult. And it actually, I look at it the opposite because you can cheat the wind in hill country, you can't in flat ground. So that's one huge benefit. Also in hill country, it greatly defines where the deer move, likely move, and where they likely don't move. And so it really separates where deer move, where they don't, where deer are at during the daylight, where bucks bed, meaning they'll bed on the opposite side of the cover range from with food. Doesn't matter if the food's high, they'll bed low. If the food's low, they'll bed high. So lots of detail in there. We go over a lot of different scenarios, it's very detailed. But what I really wanted to mention is Camp Kicking Bear. Go to kickingbear.org. They're selling these calendars right now. It's January, it's a great time to buy. And all that money goes to a great organization. This is a charity event that we host on Father's Day. We'll have it again this year. 50 people can come, pay a fee. All that money goes to Kicking Bear. We don't keep anything. And we're getting large enough for that. We've donated over $50,000 to Camp Kicking Bear over the last two years as WHS organization based on the fine people out there that have either come to the event or they've gotten into our hunting raffle, which is $100 per raffle ticket. Uh, we do that all legally. And, um, and then you can get a chance to have a hunt, come out here and spend uh, a few days with us end of September. And I can tell you this year, um, our goal is five-year-old only. And that's for our entire property for the entire season. So um, I can't guarantee you'll see or you'll get a chance at a five-year-old, but I can guarantee that they're here and there always is a chance that you could shoot a five-year-old and someone will be sitting with you filming. It's a great time. Let's get back to this right here though. Lakes. I'm And I'm thinking of properties in my head when I'm talking to you about this. So this is... um. It's an interesting one right here where there was actually public land up here that was unhunted. Public meaning it was owned by the public, but people weren't allowed to hunt it. People were allowed to use it, walk on it. Uh, 40 acre parcel, like this. And then the lake was like this through this corner. So this is all lake right here. So with that lake, it made it pretty tough because Here's a lake right here. And this is a property that 
I talk about sometimes because the cabin was right here. Food plot was right behind it. Every time they went out on the property with a food plot right here, so they're going out into this almost like funnel of a property, and they're, they're going through the food plot, spooking deer every time in and out, and they just run back to this public unpressured land, and there's no reason for that deer to ever come back to their land during the daylight. So they hadn't seen a daylight buck for years. There are no rubs on the property except for this side, which is where they didn't access. They couldn't access over by the water. There's a couple rubs all the way back up here. I like the lakes. I like them because, you again, it, it represents an absolute. Instead of accessing all right from behind the cabin because it was convenient, all into the property, spooking deer, and you walk down the road, access right against the water make sure you have a nice trail that you can get to it you know so that's one way where you can access if it's too wet though what they were doing great method is to go over here and they had a spot where they could take a canoe that would get them right over the lake and then they had a really good spot right here that was firm that they could pull the canoe into and that was a great way to get it they padded their canoe put their bow on the padded rails they could slip silently out across the water now of course when it turned to ice there's some problems with that later in the season but this is great for a month and a half two months of the season for them to be able to use that and then when it firmed up they could just use a lake but you have to pick a side what i mean by that is i liked this access too you know along this edge and i like this access right here I like the food source right here, but they needed to screen it from the cabin, make sure it was hidden, expand it into the to north, into the property, so it was more of a consistent draw. Now you have those evening stands that you can hunt closer to the cabin. Around here, there's deer moving to that food source. You could even take the canoe around here during the middle part of the season, early part of the season, get into a spot where deer are here bedded, coming down. But you start to make that funnel, or deer are bedded here, does closer, bucks further, maybe even up here on the public. But they're all going like this every single day down to that food source. You're using those lake as access. You can blow your scent with northwest winds back in the lake. You can use this access over here. You can get back up here by using the lake to morning stand. You're going well away from the food store, for food source. You can slip over here, get up here for movements where deer are coming back to you, you're getting right on the back side of their bedding area. So you could still create that assemblage of stands with the lake and the lake actually helps you because you can blow your scent into the lake, access along the lake. But again, you have to pick a side. What I mean by that is you can't continually go through the middle and drive deer off your land every single day. People say, well, the deer bed on the side. The reason we found rubs there and we found rubs there are the places because they didn't access there. It's amazing how the deer will tell you almost where you should be accessing. Then people say, well, we can't access there because that's where our sign's at. The sign's there on the edge of your property next to your neighbors because deer are living on your neighbors because you're accessing in the middle. So picking a side, I'd rather pick the sides in that case. Pick the lake side, the east side of the property, the west side of the property. Access along those and give your heart of the heart of your property a break. Work on the habitat, especially going north. Put your food down cl as close to the cabin as you get, and we'll talk about that in point number three here with a with a an example here, and uh, and then make sure you're trying to create as much depth of cover going up this way. That allows you to layer box, get some closer to bedding. The worst thing you do is put a food source all the way here at the back because why would the deer ever live on your land? They'll just live on the public unhunted, un unpressured land back there, and then come onto the property and. Uh, and then you never get a chance to see them during the daylight. So, which is kind of what was happening right now, just because there's so much pressure here, just bumped all the deer off. And because the deer being bumped off, there wasn't a regular pattern of bucks even using the food source in the first place. So it's similar in some respects because you, most of the time you're cheating the food to one side of the property or the other. That creates that depth, but it also creates the assemblage of stands because if food is on the right side of the property, covers on the left side, that means you can come in behind the cover on the left side during the morning, wait for the deer to come back to you or you can hunt on the right side of the property closer to food as deer are moving from that cover to the food source in the afternoon evening hours. I hope that makes sense. That's in a stand assemblage where you have morning evening. I even heard of a habitat person one time they said you can't define a morning stand. What's a morning stand? Well that's because they don't understand the difference between evening is food, morning is bedding, how you separate those because sometimes people put food over their property so much there really truly is no morning spot or evening spot because the deer aren't bedding there there's too much food and they're not there in the morning because there's too much food. Everything's random you're not creating that funneled movement like we're talking about and that's what leads to this one right here where I say school plant 15 neighborhood when I mentioned plant 15 
My father passed away in 2019, but for 34 years, he worked at Plant, plant 15 in General, Mo at General Motors at, in Pontiac. So that's, he worked there. Wynn and Wayne were a couple guys he worked with for a long time, heard their names. He went in faithfully. I think it was about 3.15 every day. I'd be there at 4, 4 a.m. Um, a lot of times work 10-hour days. He was home about 3, 2.30, something like that. But uh, religiously, um, you know, six days a week. It was funny because everyone he worked with had to work on Sundays. But for whatever, when he was young, he, he went to church. And uh, when he first hired in, he told him, I can't work Sunday. And he's pretty stubborn. My dad, I get my some of my stubbornness from him. Uh, I'd say most of it. <laughs> but uh, he was a really great person. But he's very stubborn. And um, But he told him, I'm not going to work on Sunday if uh if, if I'm hired. And they actually agreed to that. And so for his entire 34 years at General Motors, even though everyone else had to work on Sundays, he never had to work on Sundays. And uh, But bottom line is, plant 15, I think about that when I'm thinking about factories, I'm thinking about a property. Um, and I'm thinking of two that are similar with a school and a factory uh, either on either one. It was in Lower Michigan. And so imagine this, it was probably about a 30 acre parcel. It was a little irregular, like went along a stream like this, then it had a flat edge, and then it was on a road like this. So it was a little bit irregular on the east and west, and then over here there's a factory, there's a property, maybe, oh, eight to ten years ago I went to in lower Michigan. And so the factory's right here, and what that meant was there's a high fence all the way along there. Keep people out, no trespassing. It worked out nice, because his road came in on this side, and you know, right away you think, where should that food go? Well, there's a couple different ways you could look at this. Uh, one, in this case, he had cover on either side up here and he had cover down here. This was fairly pressured, hunting pressure, and this was not up here. He had a lot of good cover back in this heart right over here. He had more opening up here. So what that gave us the ability to do is, I really like bringing food, putting food, at a dead end and what i mean by that it might be like in the case before with the lake example you're bringing deer to the cabin but not so close to the cabin that every time you walk out the front deer you spook deer off the food plot deer might get used to a little bit of noise but they don't want to see you they don't want to hear you step outside it's one thing if they hear a door slam or a car roll up but it's completely the other if they can see you, smell you, hear you really close up like that. And so you're bringing deer to that dead end. It might be that you're drink, bringing them to a dead end of an ag field, meaning you have all this cover up to the north, ag fields to the south, put a big food plot right before the ag field, holds the deer until dark in your food, kind of like we do in Wisconsin on the property we hunt, and then you let them go to the ag fields after dark. So it really protects them and holds them within that pattern you're trying to develop. In this case, I really like that dead end of the factory. So for some nice food up here, because then you could bring deer from bedding areas back here, bring them to that food source. There's a couple food sources up there, but let's say this area represents where food is at. And then from there, they can't go to the fence, so they just go out this way. That's the safe area. That was the safe neighboring cover. That's why a lot of times when you meet a client for the first time, there's a good hour discussion on what are your neighbors doing, what kind of food sources do your neighbors have, what kind of hunting pressure is around you? I'm trying to get that big picture of your access based on what your your neighbors are doing, where current food plots are around you, not just what's on your own property. So that we can say, okay, where's a safe area to bring these deer? And I love these dead ends when you're against a factory, a school, a neighborhood, where you bring deer to that point where they don't want to pass that point during the daylight. In this case, there's a fence, so they can't. And then they spill out from there. It could be a neighborhood. They go eat ornamental shrubs and gardens and bird feeders during the day or during the night but they're not out there during the daylight bedding in someone's backyard generally. They are sometimes, but uh, for the most part, they're coming to that food plot and then you release them into the neighborhood, release them into the school, the golf course, the factory. In this case, the fence, so they're squeaking off to the sides. So that dead end of food against an absolute like that is perfect. It might even be that that's a lake where you have a lake down the south side. You're bringing deer to that lake out of their cover. You can access around that lake. Maybe your cabin's on the other side of the lake, whatever it might be. The bottom line is you bring bringing deer to an absolute. And that what that did is it gave him the ability. I remember he had an access right along the neighborhood over here. There's mixed houses, but woods, more pressure, like a little five and 10 acre lots. He could walk right along there, get into a stand here, here, here. And that'd be morning stands. And then he had stands back here. He had a stand or blind. I, can't, I think it was blind, ground blind right up by the fence. So that you could actually watch those deer come into the food source, 
not disrupt them in any way because you're coming in along the fence, wait for the deer to come to you, then they feed through the food plot, get out of there, go to wherever they're going after dark, and you get a really good glimpse at them and your downwind is completely secure because there's a fence and a factory. No different than a lot of times if it was a lake you're bringing them to, maybe even a neighborhood where you're blowing your scent into a nearby house, backyard pool and, and uh, recreational area, whatever it might be, um, ball field, um, areas where deer generally won't be at any time of the hour represent those blocking areas where you can blow scent to. So hope that makes sense. These three different properties we look, look at. You know what's interesting in this is people have mentioned this. They'll say, you know, I, of course, I talk about public land. We have a public land playlist. There might be over 30 videos on that. But there's, there's a substantial amount of videos. But um, as in my first Habitat book, uh, White Tail Success by Design, that detailed in the intro and conclusion of Public Land Hunt. I talk about that a lot. These concepts right here represent the concepts that you need to hunt with. doesn't matter where you're hunting. You want to identify those food sources, identify distant and close bedding areas. That creates that assemblage of morning stands, evening stands, food source stands, bedding area stands, rut stands during bedding area, food source stand during rut and non-rut, evening stands. So it really creates that stand assemblage for you and it doesn't matter if it's public or private land, it's still the same concept. If you hunt with these concepts on public land, you're gonna be a lot further ahead than the average public land hunter because a lot of public land hunters don't consider that private land and private land strategies can even help them when really that's just the way you should hunt whitetails in general no matter where a whitetail roams. And so if you have these conditions right here, learn to apply them to not only your own property but any public land venture you might be hunting and you'll be a lot further off and ahead than if you just try to figure this out for decades on your own. But bottom line, these are three unique, kind of weird. If you kind of looked at some of these situations, we, we, we look at some really small areas. And that kind of leads me to number four here or a bonus. Uh, Dylan's had plenty of time because I'm long winded and that's been going on for a while. <laughs> so Dylan, uh, what's your weird parcel? You need parcel. I'm coming parcel. up, I'm gonna draw it. I'm, okay, I'm, cool. I'm excited about this one. This here you go. This is one I did. This was in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, near Pittsburgh. The client's name is Doug Neeson. Heck of a dude. Become a He's become a good friend of mine. Last year I actually just stopped by just to see the parcel, take another walk on it, and we ended up going out for sushi and beers. It was awesome. Wait, does this uh, mean, can I go push buttons and stuff? Yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> Let me get that. All right. yeah, no. So, don't go too far. I'm running off of your mic. Okay, okay. But, um, so Doug's parcel is pretty cool. It kind of falls into a couple of the ones that you have where he lives on the parcel. It's 40 acres. And he has a neighborhood that is just getting put in right next to a huge housing development. It's already uh, in a pretty uh, suburban area, but his parcel runs like this. He initially started with 40 acres. He's since added on, which is awesome. But his beautiful house is right here. And uh, they are putting, there's, he's got a neighbor that lives here. And now this whole area over here is all big development going in. And um, in this area, there's a lot of um, old, I would guess it was probably like coal mining or, you know, stuff like that. So he has high walls and, you know, kind of pilings happening on his property. And um, it, this whole area back here is pretty undisturbed, undeveloped. He's since purchased a little bit of that land, but there's very limit on who can hunt back there. So it's very overgrown. So he's dealing with very like um, suburban deer that have access to cover. Um, so he's got a lot of does that live on or near his parcel, and then he has bucks that typically will live back on these, you know, more undisturbed lands. But he's got a food plot that we, uh, was already kind of there, and now we're working on kind of changing it a little bit, and it's kind of right behind his house. And normally that's not something that you would want to see, but there's this big, um, high wall here so that these deer aren't looking down at his house. They're, they're on a completely different level. And then we've worked on screening this really, really heavily here. Um, and it looks like it's right in his backyard, and it kind of is, but it's a completely separate movement. Now he's got a driveway that comes in here, uh, a big pond down here. Um, and this is all kind of shrubby lowland down here, this old driveway that comes out here. But this is just a beautiful kind of drainage from this pond and just beautiful kind of overgrown. There's apple trees, there's uh, autumn olive, really good bedding cover for uh, a lot of does and uh, stuff like that that can put up with the housing, you know, the neighborhood pressure, the road nearby and all that. But now we've worked on really, really good cover 
He's planted hundreds of trees back in here to really convert what was an old field up there to more bedding. There's a small food source here that um, is on kind of another level that um, he's doing kind of less of a substantial food source on. So it's more of just a picking up movement and sending him down to this more substantial food source here. Um, and then this whole area back here, we've really worked on creating some really good bedding back in here. And then now that he owns a little bit more acreage, we've done the same back here. So he has really good um, opportunities for dough bedding close to these food sources and then really good depth to cover going back. So he gets that really good layered bedding and his access is great where he can come in from a lot of these different sides, keep his wind sight sound uh, out of those areas and just hunt around from those edges. And what I love about opportunities like this, when you have a house in the center of a property, Jeff kind of touched on this, but like what I, the analogy I use is you're kind of behind enemy lines. You know, you're in an area that you typically wouldn't want to be and you're blowing your scent back at your house or, you know, whatever kind of obstruction you have there where typically on a contiguous 40, you wouldn't want to have that wind going in that direction while you're back there hunting. So I think it gives you a really, really good opportunity to... I like that too with that with that secondary parcel up to the northeast. Yeah. Where you're taking the same concept. This we see a lot too, where you're taking that same concept almost on the foundation parcel, then you add acreage, you take that same concept and just expand it into there. Exactly. So you're moving so you're just building your bedding areas. Back it's, sometimes in that case you need to add more food. Right. Um, not in this case, He's but I'm just saying. Done that, and that's I didn't want. It's get like too as you expand, but, but yeah, we've expanded this food plaque food plot longer into here so it's a yeah. longer more linear food source which works kind of, out great kind of like you're, you're you're supporting more acres so you need more food and right. you know kind of with that thought so Absolutely. where you wouldn't want all that food on that property if it was small and someone else owned there because you're going to place more deer further back onto your neighbor's property yep. he now owns a neighbor so yep. and yeah it, that's it, awesome it's beautiful and the the issue that doug has ran into out there is that it's so urban and Un overgrown and in between a lot of his yards and stuff that he has a lot of does that can put up with that stress so you can oh, yeah. imagine the doe numbers that he's fighting out there that but is so he common picks up a lot of bucks during and, the run. and the problem is with that is uh, when you run into that we run into problems with with too many does on a lot of parcels and that can really displace your box mm -hmm. um i'll get out of here you can wrap her up and uh in in what you see in these suburban areas you see so many does and you just can't shoot them all it just it creates a vacuum you shoot some there's more to come in so in, in that case it's very critical that you're not promoting good summer habitat meaning great food sources for does during the summer because that will come at the expense of how many bucks can live on your land or be attracted to your land especially during the early season mid season um, on your property for fall so that's one way without shooting does and in fact one of the best ways if you're having dough problems to make sure you're addressing your dough concerns by eliminating summer food sources that's the number one step uh, far more than trigger control is uh, habitat control so yeah it's a great one dylan i uh, appreciate one. it one that sticks out in my mind it's just a really unique parcel yeah well appreciate that's a really good addition to this segment and hope you guys enjoyed this and uh, can apply a lot of these concepts to not only your own unique small parcel and hunting parcel but to maybe even some of your public land hunting and, and addressing those concepts at work. It, almost every concept works the same, whether you're on private or public land hunting this fall. Hey, I'm really excited to introduce to you our Hills and Thermals web class. It's something we worked on all year. We're trying to put lots of facets of scouting, aerial imagery, diagrams on the whiteboard to really teach you how the wind moves through hills and how you should find bedding areas, how it relates to deer movements in general, how that relates to, this is a bedding area stand, this is a food source afternoon stand. We really tried to put this together and offer you a complete picture of how to navigate hills and find better success consistently where you hunt.